Reproaches of the one reproaching you fell on me. And that word reproach, another way to say it is the, the insults of the one insulting you fell on me. He himself carried our infirmities. As Matthew says, quoting Isaiah 53, he himself carried our infirmities. His stripes, the stripes that he bore were ours. And then in Mark 10, 45, where Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And as I've said before, and as we've been seeking to do, understand more and more, is that Jesus, from John especially, Jesus willingly lived and did this. He said, for the joy, as Hebrews says, before him, he took up, went to the cross. And Jesus in his ministry said, I, I look to the Father and I, and I see what the Father is doing and I want to obey the Father because I know he loves me and, and he takes delight in me and I want to obey him. And so, even as he lay in the cross, uh, was on the cross and he said, and he was suffering and the people were mocking him and, and insulting him, he could say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But it was rooted and grounded in his love and obedience to the Father. But this also bring, brings to, and I'm just going to make quick reference, this does not necessarily mean that the strong are to, uh, you know that, the common, the weakest link, right? You know, well, I'm not going to ever eat meat again because I don't want to offend my brother or my sister. It doesn't mean that you just go to the, the, the very least thing and that's what you are all stuck doing. What Paul is saying is that they are to sympathetically enter into their attitudes, as Moe says, to refrain from criticizing and judging them and do what love would require toward them. Love demands that the strong go beyond the distance implied in their toleration. They are to treat the weak as brothers and sisters, and they are not to please themselves. Because whatever things were written before, Paul then says, were written for our instruction. And Paul is saying that because earlier on in in 6.14 and 15 and then 7.4, he's, he's, he's argued that the law was fulfilled in Christ. And so the question we raise, well, what's the point then? What's the point of the Old Testament? What's the point of the Scriptures? And Paul says there's significant importance. They are still there for our instruction in order that through endurance and encouragement of scriptures, we may have hope. And so Paul is saying, listen, by the encouragement of scriptures, by the stories, by the testimony, by the word of God that has gone before, we know several things. Number one, that God is faithful, that God is merciful, that God does work in the midst of great and absolutely hopeless, seemingly hopeless situations, and he has brought his saving hand again and again and again, and the Old Testament is a story after story and testament after testament to that reality. And so the scriptures are used to encourage us to keep on, to endure, to say it seems like God is working. It seems like God is in existence in our society right now. It seems like nothing's, nothing is being saved at all. It seems like everything's being torn apart. But I can endure. I can trust God. I can praise Him because He is good and He has shown it. And so these two things, the, the, the scriptures going back to them, allowing them to shape our lives, and then that commitment to say, I'm going to trust God, gives us hope. Hope that is real. And so Paul then finds himself breaking out into a prayer, and he does this 
Whenever he kind of reaches a, 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 a significant climax, he finds himself breaking into a prayer. And he says, Now may the God of endurance and encouragement. God has endured us. <laughs> and God has persisted in his plan to bring together everything in Christ. He has persisted in his love for us. He has persisted in walking forward. This is who God is. And God is an encourager. And so Paul says, may the God of endurance and encouragement give you the same mind. In other words, to think the same things. And that word you, this is he is back to where previously he's been always, the you has been a singular, okay? In Greek, in English, we don't know whether when I say you, uh, you know, the, what we sometimes will say use, right? Use people. <laughs> um, but in Greek, there is a use and there is a use. But we don't know that here. But this is the first time where he's back to the plural of you. From 14.1 he starts off, and, and now he's back to you, plural. Speaking to the whole group. So may the God of endurance and encouragement give yous the same mind. In other words, to think the same thing. What is the same thing? Not that everyone has to be vegetarian, or not that everyone has to respect one day or all the days, or not that people have to drink wine or not drink wine. The same mind is that I will seek the heart of God. That I will seek what God's heart is for the people, which is unity. Which is working together to proclaim the name of Christ. Give you the same mind among one another according to Jesus Christ. To follow the path of Christ. So he continues, and I've got this, um, I repeated this here because I wanted you to, it continues on. According to Jesus Christ, in order that with one accord, with one mouth, you may glorify the God, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the goal. That, that whatever perspectives we bring, whatever understandings of how Scripture should be interpreted, that the one unifying thing is our, our identify, identity with Christ, so that with one accord and with one mouth we can glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, he says, and here is the, the last little bit we're looking at, the last few verses. He says, receive with open arms one another. Again, that was from 14.1. He said, receive one another. You who are, who are strong, receive one another. Now he's saying it to everyone. Therefore, receive with open arms one another, just as Christ received you for the glory of God. You see, the way God is receiving glory is when his people act as his people. When his people are the people of God. That is what Jesus prayed in John 17. Lord, may they be one as we are one that the world may know. For I say, Christ has become a servant on behalf of the truth Oh, of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers so that the Gentiles might glorify God for the sake of his mercy. Now, most of us who read that one from For I Say Christ to the end, what I've got there, it's just like whatever. It's what, but 
I want you to know something. These, this verse here is a powerful restatement of what the gospel is. The gospel of Jesus Christ. What Paul has been arguing in all of Romans. That Christ has become a servant of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? The Jews. Okay? Christ has become a servant of the Jews. In other words, remember Christ was the representative Jew who fulfilled the law and who bore the sins of Israel and of the world. So he has become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God. What is the truth of God? That God is? What is what did Paul what has Paul been yelling out in all of Romans again and again? God is? Okay, so we're gonna start Romans 1 again. Good. <laughs> God is faithful. That God is faithful to who he is and to what he says. Because who he is and what he says are one and the same. And God has been faithful to what he has promised. To confirm the promises made to the fathers. What did he say to Abraham? In you all nations of the earth will be blessed. In you all nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the promise made to the fathers. And so what does that mean? Well, Christ came and fulfilled that. So that the Gentiles might glorify God for the sake of his mercy. And so here we have the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God has acted. God has been faithful to who he is. To what he has said. And through the nation of Israel. Through Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled his promise to Abraham. That said through you all the nations will be blessed. Even as it is written. Because of this, and now Paul quotes uh, one, two, five different texts from uh, Psalms, from 2 Samuel, from Deuteronomy, and Isaiah. He says, because of this, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praise to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. And again, all you Gentiles praise the Lord and... Let all the people praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles will hope. And so Paul ends it by saying, Listen, this has been God's heart, this has been God's plan all along. We would bring Jew and Gentile together. And that is what he wants. Now how are we going to work out our differences? And Paul has sought to give some, some framework from which to work out those differences. Those different traditions. Those things that we hold dear. That others who follow Christ don't hold dear. And then he finishes with this, again, uh, a, a prayer. And because Paul knows how hard this is, what he is asking to be done is impossible. Let me say that again. What Paul is asking us to do is impossible. Why? Because there's so many ways we can get offended. And hurt, and reasons and ways to walk away. And so he says this prayer now may the God of hope, hope? Yes, because sometimes it can seem so hopeless. Sometimes it seems that what's going on in the world, but in the churches as well, that it, it, it's like, oh, where is the beauty of Christ in our relationship with one another? It can seem so hopeless. And so he prays, may the God of hope, who has shown to be provide hope all along the way, may this God fill you with all joy and all peace 
in believing. So that you may abound in hope. So that even though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, yet will I praise you. Yet will I know that God is good. Yet will I know that who God is and what he says are one and the same thing. And so if he has said it, he will do it. Oh, that you may abound in hope. Not by my own strength, because again, this prayer is, is hopeless on our own. But, because of the Spirit of God that lives within us, by His power that lives within us, it is possible. As we yield ourselves, as we walk in the Spirit, as we are filled with the Spirit, then it is possible for this prayer to be realized more and more. And for God to be free to work in and through us. And for the world to see, hey, look at this group of people who, they're so different, they're so weird, they're so wonky, and yet they come together and they worship together and they love each other. So we reflect the heart of Christ and bring glory to God. Which brings us to communion. Because again, very simply, our motivation is Christ. He is the one who shows us the way. And he is the one we are continually called back to and say, look at the way Christ did it. And then seek to do that for this time, for the time you're in now, and the Spirit will help you. So I think the time, the text that is so appropriate for our communion time is Philippians 2. The one we continually come back to. Listen as I read it again. Therefore, if any of you have encouragement from being united with Christ, uh, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Again, what this verse is saying, very simply, boldly, and without without um, uh, without uh, apology, it says, "Listen, if you are in Christ, you are in each other. There is no lone ranger Christian. You are called to walk and to live together." So if you have anything, any encouragement from being united with Christ, then your relationship with other people will be different. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I'm going to eat whatever food I want. But that guy doesn't like to drink wine. Well, I like to drink wine. I don't care about him. Don't do it like that. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a perfect man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, 
God exalts him to the highest place. God gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every time you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And how was this accomplished? That will turn to Isaiah 53 as we focus again on the, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a dry, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised. He was rejected by humankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. Oh, he's so embarrassing. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord was laid on, has laid on him the sin of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet, who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people.